there were several people from St. John's College and Thomas Aquinas College who had that Great Books experience in school. And they wanted to have Great Books seminars for people who just wanted to continue their education. So they and that started in 1998. So having a seminar about once every six weeks. But teachers were coming regularly over the years. <clears throat> and they told us, we're using this in, in our classrooms. We're taking your curriculum and, and applying it. Um, we just think it's really wonderful. We would love it if you could come to our schools and teach us how to do it in our schools. And that gave us the idea of incorporating, becoming an, uh, an official nonprofit and, and applying for grants so we can go to those schools. So that's what we've been doing since then. Um, so to date, we've done about 165 public seminars. So people talk these days about what the value of liberal education actually is, and I guess understanding how to think about that requires first understanding what liberal arts education is. And it, it has, the conception has changed a lot from the original Greeks to what it is today. Uh, originally, the idea was that to be a, a, a good citizen uh, and to be a good person, there were certain things that you needed to study and know. Uh, and then that sort of morphed over the years and in our more recent years turned into Western civilization, understanding Western civilization, maybe reading the best books that have been written uh, about Western civilization. And then that kind of morphed out to liberal arts could really mean anything. The value of the kind of liberal arts education that we're talking about at Agora and that a handful of colleges in the United States and other parts of the world are promoting is, is different than what we think of as liberal arts in a more general sense. It's rather a concentrated study in mathematics, in science, in politics, and theology that, um, that pays very close attention to the great works of civilization. Now sometimes that's Western civilization, sometimes it's Eastern, sometimes it's the great works of the world. Uh, and second, that approach is not simply that you read the book and hear someone lecture about it, but that you sit with a group of other students, a small group, maybe 20 or 15, and a tutor, might otherwise be called a professor, or two, and you have a discussion of that work. Now that holds if you're studying music, math, science, English, etc. And, and the learning that goes on in that discussion is really quite remarkable and quite different. Uh, teachers generally in the, in the high school, but they could be grade school or even college, are challenged every day to try to make their classes uh, exciting, uh, get the students active in their own learning, um, make the class time productive. And so we've had uh, this outreach for many years now to teachers, to uh, school districts, that we provide something that's, I think, really helpful for the development of, of teachers so that they can learn methods to engage their students in an active learning and, and active learning really is an essential component to an enthusiastic student because when they think that the the questions that are being asked are their own questions and the way to resolve some of these issues using the texts um, make them part of the solution they, they, see, they take their education more seriously. It's not simply something passively received. Teachers see that. And as a result, we've had great success, I think, working with teachers and school districts to provide this opportunity. Teachers can come uh, once a month or around that and, and, and engage in, in seminars at all levels with all, all sorts of folks around the table. And whether it's philosophy, or science, or mathematics, or literature, uh, I think they come, come away from that experience thinking, there's techniques I can employ in my class that'll improve the lives of my students. The, 
the the main thing is still our our regular public seminars typically one day events and they're around the Ojai Valley sometimes they'll be in Los Angeles but typically they're somewhere in Ojai um, and anybody can come to those as few or as many as they want uh, to go which you've gone you know and um, we try to cover everything from literature poetry political science um, math and science uh, sometimes what's called natural philosophy what's turned into like physical science but again, philosophy and theology. So we try to cover a little bit of everything, including leading up to the modern time. But in addition to that, our Teachers for Lifelong Learning program, that's where we write grants for teachers to come to the public seminars for free. We also consult with them on curriculum development, and then we will work with schools to go and teach their entire faculty or a, a department in their school. And then um, more recently, our Ojai Chautauqua panels. So we thought, let's have a panel with experts representing all the sides. Let's say if it's fracking, you would have an oil guy, an, an environmentalist, uh, an attorney, let's say, a politician, um, and, and a geologist. They would have a full-on conversation about fracking, and we get to benefit from their conversation. And then we get to ask our questions. And so we've done 13 in the past four years, and every single time, what we think is that the, the two sides are here and here, and it turns out they're really more like here and here. They're not that far apart. Once the experts start talking, and they realize they agree on a lot more than we thought going into it, and everybody learns from it. <clears throat> so that's translated also into not just civil discourse, but also civil engagement. So people are understanding it better, uh, whatever the issue is. And if it's local, that could be something like water or tourism. And you see a lot of activism coming as a result. So the, the Ojai Chautauqua is sort of what we get to do with the seminar, but with an audience of 350 people on a complicated subject. The last one was on water. And so we had board members from two of the water basins, um, Casitas Municipal Water District, a city council person. Um, and so basically, we tried to look at what are all the things about water right now and what are the proposals on the table to deal with the lake that's happening right now. So that's kicking off a new series of Ojai focused events. So we'll continue to do sort of what we think of as nationally focused events like education or something like that. But um, we'll be doing things like Ojai's changing population, huge issue, um, housing. So we'll tackle each one of those sort of one at a time. And we're going to do another water event in September. So we thought, let's take a really tough subject, uh, something that has many facets. And in this case, the subject is humanity's place in the natural world. And so we think, well, it, it's a really interesting question because you can see how Obviously, our bodies are so similar to animals' bodies, right? So you say, okay, we share a lot in common with, with all life, and especially animal life. But there's so many things that are so different about us than we see in the rest of the animal kingdom, right? Like abstraction, you know, this kind of language that we use. And, and there's times when we feel very alienated in the world, like we feel like we don't belong. And, um, and if you look at our origin stories, there are many that say, you know, the gods or God made people out of clay and then breathed life into the people. And so then you think, okay, so your body is made of clay, but the thing that makes you alive is the breath of these powerful forces. And then you think, well, no wonder. And that's maybe, maybe it makes sense that, that you don't make sense here. But then you see an alienation from nature is causing a lot of um, concern, depression, anxiety. And so now you see an entire movement saying, get back out into nature. And that asks you, uh, or forces the question, well, what is nature? What is natural? What is natural for people? And so what we thought is, let's tackle the subject over four days, over a series of readings that would be led by tutors, and I'm going to get to the, the method in a second. But basically, you would read these texts. Um, we, we start with uh, a Roman scientist, Lucretius. We're going to go all the way to the modern time. But it'd be some poetry, some people like uh, Thoreau and Emerson being out in nature, and that's where we're supposed to be. But then somebody like Bacon would have more of a reductive scientific view of nature um, as more like just physical forces. In addition to those seminars, we'll have a couple of lectures. We'll have nature walks. So you would actually go out in there and look at the flora and fauna by an expert, guided by an expert. And then um, an astronomy night. And so it's all catered and it'll be at the Ohio retreat. So we think this is a great opportunity to dig into a subject more deeply over time with the same group of people. I'm really excited about it.